Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends and foes alike. I am the West Virginia woman, Robin Holstein of RobinHolstein.com and Holstein House, where my guests get a good night's sleep at a fair rate plus breakfast. I've been keeping house since I was 17 years old, balancing the budget and paying the bills as an army wife on the salary of a PFC stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, and as a single mother of two back home in West Virginia. Things have changed a lot since then, but I haven't forgotten what it was like. This podcast looks at society and cultural issues affecting families in West Virginia and in the United States, from food preparation and storage, gardening, home repairs, current events, and more. We'll go round the table and back in 60 minutes or less. So let's hang out and talk a while. Good morning. How are you this morning? I hope you are well. I'm just getting up and getting started. Well, that's not that's not true. Um, it is. I'm recording this a little after seven in the morning. I've been up. Sin- I've been out of bed since four thirty. I've been awake since about three because the dog had to get up in the middle of the night. She's getting terrible about that. I don't know if it's because we're not letting her out. Um, In the uh, in the eat right before we go to bed, or if we're just she's having too much water before she goes to bed, or if there's something else going on. But she's had to get up the last couple nights and and go out, which is fine. I mean, I get up and go out too. Well, I don't go out. I go downstairs. I go down to the facilities. Not every night, but usually. Usually. So, okay. We are looking at episode 18, I believe, if my count's correct. Episode 18, not counting the two specials that we did on Veterans Day. And uh, today we're going to look back uh, just briefly at the interviews that I did that posted over the weekend and if you didn't get a chance to uh, hear those please set aside some time because they're both kind of lengthy I did I got my interview with Toolman Tim and I got my interview in with Lisa Hayes Minnie Miney pardon me I'm sorry it's Lisa Hayes Miney and they both actually went a couple hours the interview with Toolman Tim and his wife Becky I left at two hours I didn't split it. I didn't do anything with it except add the intro and the outro. It's pretty much raw <laughs> from from the time I hit record to the end. I didn't clip anything. I didn't correct anything. The interview with Lisa, I did split, and that was more for Lisa's benefit. Lisa is someone that I think a lot of, and uh, I thought it would benefit her more in trying if she was trying to share the interview if it was split because like I said they're both a couple hours and we're going to talk a little bit about Christmas not a lot about Christmas a little bit about maybe doing some Christmas readings and um, some essential oils and your pets a little bit about what's toxic and what what is not toxic and just some general stuff today Glad to have you along. Hope you will boost and clip and share. I usually, you know, I guess I don't say a lot of things that are clip worthy because I don't, I don't get clips unless I do my own. And of course, if you if if you find anything I say today of value to you, I hope you will share that value by sharing a few sats. I don't like to say tip because tipping gives the idea of there's a set value like you know when you go out to eat you spend say fifty dollars on a meal so there's a set value that meal was fifty dollars twenty percent of that you know is what you're tipping your waitress or waiter wait staff servers whatever the whatever you want to call them and uh, I just, you know, this kind of thing, especially on a podcast, uh, I don't know that you can put a number on it. I don't know whether what I share with you is worth $5 or $500 or 5000 You know it's worth 5000 
So tip accordingly, no. No, value for value, the idea behind value for value, if you are just coming across this, is what you think it's worth, please share it. So if you think it was worth $2, then share two. Of course, in SAS, that's altogether different, but if you, uh, if you feel that it's of benefit to you, then, then share a little love back this way. And in my opinion, that could also be by promoting the episode or the podcast by sharing the the link with your friends and say hey this is this is an interesting interesting podcast that I think you would get some benefit from or enjoy listening so there you go episode 18 of the hosting house podcast so I mentioned uh, Christmas readings <laughs> I've been thinking about this. I'd like to do something. I don't know if I'd make it an annual. Annual assumes that I'm going to be here this time next year, which I, I hope I am. Because I enjoy this. But an annual reading of some sort around Christmas. Now, in my local church, our pastor has traditionally read the... Christmas story or the birth of Christ story from the book of Luke in the New Testament and I could do that I debated on do I need some music in the background and if I did I'd have to get something that uh, I don't have to pay royalties on because I'd never be able to keep up with that and a lot of the stuff I hear that's royalty free is kind of meh pardon me I'm still having my coffee but then also I thought, well, you could also read this, The Night Before Christmas. I have a copy of that somewhere. It may be in the building my other o my office is in. I, I can see it in my mind's eye, and I hate that because I, I go for these. <laughs> yesterday, I'm, st I'm finalizing Christmas decorations in the house because it's just, <clears throat> I get my days so, um, so full of stuff that I, I can't I have almost no flexibility and then eventually it breaks the calendar breaks and but um, <clears throat> so I'm still doing some fine-tuning and I don't have elaborate decorations this isn't a a magazine cover or better homes and garden type um, house with that type of decorations it's not this is this is pretty you know blue collar <laughs> um, I don't want to say redneck because I don't have a lot of really weird nasty and, and I say nasty kind of broad not not in the, not in these um, implied sexuality type of nasty but uh, I, I don't have a lot of junk uh, Christmas decorations and um, my stuff is usually either a few Santa Claus I've got a little rocking horse a little it's a it's a resin rocking horse with it's kind of a Victorian style with some toys on it and I've got a few um, nutcrackers little little ones and I've got a few ceramic pieces and some pot, uh, artificial flowers and things of course the trees I have the two trees but they're not the one tree in the dining room it has all the traditional uh, decorations that I have kept over the years not <laughs> not all of them Lord, they never all fit H has the it's decorated with the one the handmade or um, special decorations that I you know would would by some be considered cluttered or I don't know it it has uh, a, a few handmade things and it has some plastic things and it it's TG and Y TG and Y it has a few of the the TG and Y things that I still have left and uh, made in China stuff you know and then the one in the living room if you want to call it formal it's more formal it has only four 
decorations on it that are mm, like a hallmark, uh, the one that says our first Christmas together uh, for, the, for the year that Wayne and I got married, 2001. It has uh, two that were baby's first Christmas. It has one, it's a Cinderella for my grandniece that I got for her first Christmas because I couldn't find one with her birth year on it. And it has one for my son, my older son's first Christmas. And then the rest of them are uh, the bows, the garland, the lights, the um, ornamental bulbs, you know. And actually, they're all plastic. You wouldn't know that unless you got right up on them. They're all plastic because I live in a house with hardwood floors. And the first time a, a glass ornament hits the hardwood floor is usually the last time that glass ornament hits the hardwood floor. And heaven help you, try to vacuum up all those little tiny shards. So it, it is very nice. It's blue and silver, and it is very nice... Uh, looking tree and uh, it's more formal the living room decor is there there's a couple of um, vintage Santa tree toppers Victorian style cream colored and gold trim there's my ponzettas the uh, artificial ponzettas two of them are the traditional red ones one of them is a white ponzetta and then my manger scenes, and I have a couple of those. I've got another one i got to put up. It needs a little attention. It got kind of, the newsprint got on it, and I have to get that cleaned up before I get it out. And then I'm going to, um, today I hope to get all the boxes, because I'll, all my boxes are out on the front porch, get all the boxes put back in the outbuilding, because the yard has been so smushy, and it's been rainy, and it was just easier on me to leave them on the front porch till I get them moved. I'll get those moved today. And then I don't know how many of my outside decorations I'll get out. I've got a couple of Christmas themed pillows on the front porch. They're outdoor pillows, so it's not like cotton and they're going to mold and be nasty. But I've got a couple of those um, lights that you stick. They're almost like a spotlight, only they have the globes, the things in them that spin around that has some um, snowflakes that looks like it's snowing and then one of them was one of those original ones that had the red and green dots and they don't move they just sit there it's really kind of weird and I, I put it on the back of the house for the back door neighbors to it looks awful <laughs> it really looks awful it doesn't spin or anything it's just a series of red and green dots on the back of the house it's crazy but that's uh that's what I'll be doing a lot of today uh, later after the sun comes up good and it warms up a little bit. It's kind of frosty out there right now. But it's supposed to be dry. So, but I, I love Christmas. I love holidays, whether it's Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, it doesn't matter because they're times of celebration. Even Memorial Day, um, really Memorial Day, we should be reflecting. But we don't. We celebrate. <coughs> and that's okay. That's okay, too. Anytime family can get together, I'm happy with that. But I'm trying to think, uh, oh, I know where I was going. In my mind's eye, <laughs> in my mind's eye, I can see the book. It's just a little tiny child's book, the, the cardboard cover, and it's got the traditional uh, Santa Claus story in it. And there's not very many pages because the story's not that long, really. And I suppose it's really more of a rhyme than a story. But anyway, so I can see that in my mind's eye, but... But yesterday when I was doing the mantle, putting the stockings up on the mantle and getting the decorations up on the mantle, I realized, oops, I don't have a little stocking for Bob, the dog. And I have one for Betty, but I don't have any place to put it because I did some work on the um, the bricks. I did I, I dry brushed some, um, some paint on the bricks to change the color just a little bit on the bricks in the front room, in the living room fireplace. And I had had these command hooks for my other dogs, for Jack and Gracie. And I had command hooks on there to hold their little stockings. And it, they, were, they, were the clear, they were the clear ones, so you didn't really notice them on the, on the brickwork through the year. I can, and I could leave them there. And then 
the little stockings that we had for uh, Jack or yeah Jack and Gracie they're just you know not four inches just a little decorative one I didn't put anything in them anyway but it was just to you know to complete the family thing you know well I don't have one for Bob I have one for Betty White but I don't have one for Bob White so I needed to get one and I thought well let me go ahead I need to put the command hooks back up and I couldn't find my command hooks. And I thought, well, I've got a thing of them downstairs. I'll go down and get them. And in my mind's eye, I knew exactly where they were. I walked down the stairs and around the corner, and they weren't there. I know I wasted a couple hours. No, I wasted a good 45 minutes, though. A good 45 minutes hunting for those. I don't ever did find them. I could have walked to the Walmart and back by then, but I didn't yet. I may do that today. I'd really need to walk. The things that I need from Walmart, I could carry them on grocery bags, so I could carry them back. Probably die of a heart attack because I haven't walked in over a year. Any distance at one time, like for exercise. So, But anyways, I'm thinking about reading those things and uh, having them each as a separate uh, podcast upload. And um, I'd love to know what you think. Would you? Do you want to hear me read? I mean, I don't know. I like the idea. Think about it. Let me know. So my interview with Toolman Tim and his white wife, Becky, I- is up. I mentioned that earlier. It's up. The video is up on YouTube. And the podcast is up here. And I'll put a link in the show notes so you can get to it easy if you want to. Um, my show notes go so long because I copy and paste from every, the same thing for everything. But I'll, I'll, I'll get it in there in the upper portions of it so you can find it easy. Um, it's titled An Evening with Mrs. and Toolman Tim. And it, yeah, it's a couple hours. It's a couple hours. So my recommendation is use the podcast and sit and listen to it while you're doing other things, while you're putting up decorations perhaps. <laughs> Or driving to and from work and spend the week listening to it. Either way, we we talked for a couple hours. It 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 was I feel like it was informative and fun. Uh, we talked about basics of, of tools for around the house and and some of the differences in men w- women and men relating to dealing with these tools. Uh, for instance, for instance, uh, Becky does point out that as a female, and this pro- is I think generically true across the female gender and I'm not talking about transgender I'm talking about born female with the right chromosomes wide hips or wide pelvis I should say anyways generally our hands are smaller than men's so even if we can build the upper body strength our hands are smaller and so it makes it more difficult and I find this with the guitar and that's one of the things that has discouraged me from learning to play guitar is that I cannot, along with the fact that I haven't been playing since I was newborn, um, my hands, I can't get my hands around the neck to get to this, the strings. And so it's very frustrating to me. What I could do and can do and could do, I have the ability to because we have two um, smaller guitars is I could use those. I haven't done it yet. I <laughs> can't find time barely can get the Christmas decorations up but anyway she she pointed this out and they were talking and they use a, a hammer a household hammer I think it was a four pound or whatever three pound four pound hammer <coughs> and and she talked about Tim's hammer is really difficult for her to use so she has a smaller hammer and it's fiberglass and she can use it wonderfully and she can you know basically keep up with him even though as a male he has the hand and arm strength and she doesn't and the fiberglass hammer has less vibrations so you know it, it doesn't for someone who's not a roofer or contractor you know remodeler doing internal work you know putting two, two befores and stuff up all day long with nails it's easier for her to use so you know and it was a, it was a fun conversation um there are there are some differences in um the sexes the natural born sexes i mean honestly you you can try to deny it all day long but 
when we started seeing the transgendered swimmer just whipping the the female swimmers out of the pool it it was like stating the obvious on video you know he's much broader across the shoulders he's got much bigger uh, arm span and he's got more upper body strength and he could he could beat those girls and it became an issue all at once in our face and now we're dealing with it in every category of life but anyway so they talked about that it was fun um it, it really was and uh, towards the end we we were just you know off the rails talking about them possibly moving to the united states part-time and purchasing property and things that they're going to do and um, everybody's going to tennessee and pretty soon tennessee's going to be just overwhelmed hello come home to west virginia <laughs> we don't have as much flat land but you can hide here anyway <clears throat> tennessee is flatter than west virginia west virginia is entirely the the, the state is entirely within um the appalachian mountains and tennessee only has part in the appalachian mountains i don't know if that may or may not be a good thing i don't know but i will neither confirm nor deny the facts of nude beaches in florida being discussed on the podcast with tim and becky and then i also had the interview with lisa haynes money uh she is probably the most diverse and accomplished woman i know of now uh, she has imagined created published and distributed the most popular free magazine focusing on the culture and activities in West Virginia. She, she, she put that m magazine out for 10 years. And I mean even delivering it. It wasn't just, you know, uploading it to the web and people download. No, no, this was a print, color print magazine. <coughs> they, she and her husband were printing 18,000 copies for distribution within 18 West Virginia counties and had about 100 uh, subscriptions that were mailed to different uh, a, a, a total of 16 different states and she kept tr she kept track of all the stuff and she said she had less than one percent of her magazines not distributed so and and a lot of them were found at the rest areas and you could you couldn't the day that she delivered them to the rest areas you couldn't find them that evening they were picked up people loved them people loved them and full disclosure i did write for it the last couple years I did a an upcycle column, uh, and it was a monthly magazine. So I did an upcycle column for her every month for the last couple years of the print magazine, <coughs> and I now contribute to her Substack, which we kind of talked about there. She does have she she took a break from the uh, print magazine, which was called Tulane Living. I don't think I mentioned that yet. It's Tulane Living, and she took a break from it for a couple years and brought it back under Substack. And it's and she has titled that Tulane Renaissance, and she goes into why she called it that and um, how she got to that point. And it again, uh, I felt like it was a really good interview. Obviously, I'm not you know a big time television or radio news uh, reporter, but I thought it was was very went very well. Um, and Lisa, uh, you know, all of this she's done while she, she st has stayed true to her calling as an author and a writer. Uh, and, and she's just been very successful. I've known her for over 20 years. I'm not 100% sure how I found her, but I know I was looking for ways to promote my husband's Southern Rock Band. Um, the Southern Rock Band was called Rock and Horse, and, and there was five guys there. And... Um, it was uh, it was a really good and very popular at the time, and I was had built them built a web page for them, and was trying to promote it. And I was distributing their e electronic newsletter, and and um, uh, it was doing fairly well towards the end. And uh, Lisa was running a page called West Virginia Cottages, and um, I sh I wore her down until she accepted Rock and Horse as a as an advertiser in West Virginia cottages and uh, it, I mean she, 
southern rock band's not a cottage industry, but I can try to convince her it was, and she gave in. I split her interview into two parts, uh, so you'll be able, you know, there's part, obviously part one and part two, and I, I hope you'll take some time to listen to those. It's a very interesting perspective on doing business in small town and very rural West Virginia. Uh, Gilmer and Calhoun County and um, dealing with some of the local politics of being a woman in print magazine business 20 years ago and some of the things she struggled with to keep it going and what happened when she decided that it she was just overwhelmed and it had gotten too big for her to manage so it's um, it's a really good I think uh, interview Alright, so I have a YouTube video up, and I will link to my YouTube page uh, in the show notes. Uh, how, using steam to relax the wrinkles on your polyester ponzettas or polyester uh, flowers for the holidays. I have the three, uh, and they're very inexpensive, uh, artificial ponzettas that I use during the holiday. And they go back into a particular box every year and uh, they they tend to get really wrinkled I don't let real ponzettas in the house because I have house cats and ponzettas are toxic to house cats they're toxic to any cat <laughs> but they're toxic to my house cats I don't I don't accept them if people try to give them to me I I find a way to offload them uh, real ones right away I don't even want them in the house the cats may not fool with them because I mean cats aren't idiots but you know sometimes I get curious and uh, I don't leave my cats getting sick off of some tropical plant that somebody gave me um, so a lot of times when I take not just the ponzettas although they're the largest ones so they're really obvious uh, out at, a after being packed for 11 months or so they're wrinkled and I could just flop them up anywhere, but you know I like to brush them off a little bit, and and get the wrinkles out. And and when you put when I put them in the boxes, they kind of get along with wrinkled and mashed. They're you know you just kind of gotta fiddle with them and and straighten them back out to make them look nice. And I just use a, a hand clothing steamer. You know you've seen those steamers that you get to take the wrinkles out of your curtains and your and your suits and stuff but it's something like that only it's a travel one it's a small one um, that I bought years ago to take to a conference and haven't really used it since but I use it to take the the wrinkles it does a very good job now these these artificial flowers were were purchased when I was working for the state conservation agency and I left there in 2007 and I had bought them there was a Dollar General store at Sissonville and and the conservation agency was at Guthrie so Sissonville was a couple mile drive and uh, where we frequently went for lunch there was a couple sit local sit-down restaurants a Chinese restaurant a, um, a, a an American cuisine restaurant a Wendy's and something else maybe a Taco Bell I don't remember it's been so long um, I, I picked up the ponzettas at the Dollar General and uh, brought them into my office and from a distance they look very real as a matter of fact you have to get right up on them to look at the plastic stems to realize that they are artificial and um, so they I've had them for a long time and I just t treat them gently I mean you know I could really tear them up if I wanted to it wouldn't be that hard but I treat them gently and I you know, if a leaf falls off, I hot glue it back. I mean, I just, I just try to take care of them. I know they weren't expensive, but there's no point in just tearing them up. You know, why, why just do that? So uh, my holiday decorations are just about in place. There's some fine tuning and some tidying up I need to do. I need to put the boxes away and um, try to get the outdoor stuff done today if possible. And along the lines of holidays and decorations, I, I've always had some type of a pet. 
uh, whether it's a dog, a cat, I've had parakeets, finches, cockatoos, and fish. And, it, you know, when I was a two or three years old, my dad brought, ho brought home a black and tan hound dog and, and named him Snoopy, and he was my dog, and that dog, <laughs> oh gosh, he followed me everywhere. I mean, in his latter years, it was just, he lived so long. I, I mean, I think I was in junior high when, when he was finally gone, and I mean, it, he just, bless his heart, he got hit by a truck, not like at full speed because he lived, I mean, it, and it cracked his jaw and stuff, and then he had seizures after that, and every so often he'd flop around having a seizure, but he was a good dog. My dad tells stories about that dog, you know, I, when I was a kid, I got out of the yard, I mean, kid, kid, baby kid, two or three years old, got out of the yard, and, and the dog come and got dad, and I mean, kind of like Lassie and Timmy fell down the well type of thing. <laughs> and Dad figured out that I was the dog wanted something, and, and then the dog walked past him, and he followed the dog, and there I was out in the road. And little stories like that. But um, so I've had no, I, and and since then I've had I was counting, and I don't think I missed any. I've had no less than ten dogs in my life, and. Uh, so I've always had always had a dog and currently I have Bob and Betty White now uh, we adopted Betty I should have said Betty and Bob White in November of 2021 she is a white boxer about 11 years old it's hard to know exactly how old she was because she's a rescue uh, she was found stray and almost dead I mean she she didn't have an inch of fat on her body and I don't mean the kind of show dog look uh, of skinny for a boxer. I mean her ribs were, the, the skin was hanging and sucking between her ribs and the knobs on her spine were showing. I mean, she was in bad shape. But we adopted her and, um, and she's, she's come along just fine. And Bob, we just adopted in this July, July of 2022. So... Uh, <laughs> the rescue and we drove a long way to get him because I kept seeing uh, boxers on the um, animal shelter sites and they would be up today and I would call in the morning and then they would be gone a rescue of some sort they already had some arrangement so yeah they put their picture up but they really weren't available because they had already contacted a rescue and the rescue was already on the way to get them and then you would have to deal with the rescue but the rescue that was coming in to get these dogs and this was up until last July and then I stopped keeping track we're taking them out of state and then didn't um, didn't adopt back into West Virginia so it was getting difficult and even the rescue that I worked with to get Betty um, they were having a rough time um, saving dogs from this area because this out-of-state uh, big-name place was coming in and getting them and I mean, in the big picture, as long as the animals are well treated and saved, that's the key. But, you know, there's those of us who are willing to take them in, and they, we, we couldn't. Because not just anybody's going to take a boxer. They're big, they're clumsy, they're like having perpetual two-year-olds. It takes, they're high energy until they get up there in age. So it takes a, a, uh, a particular type of, um, of household to, uh, to take in a boxer. Okie dokie. Let's see. Um, oh, well, Bob is not, they tried to tell us he was boxer. He's not a boxer. He doesn't have a drop of boxer DNA in him. But we'd made this long trip. <coughs> they had supposedly given him a bath. I don't think they did. They said they did, but I don't think they really did. Um, he was running around. They told us, oh, he's good with cats. He's not good with cats. I mean, we really had to keep an eye on him to, and um, try to train him to leave our cats alone. And even still yet, he'll take a lunge at them if they run. But, um, and he's still to this day, even after being neutered, I mean, he was neutered before we picked him up. And he still has that boy dog smell. And it is just terrible trying to deal with that, that dog. So what I, and, and this will make sense here in just a minute, I you have been, I've used an automatic air freshener, just a little battery powered air freshener that you get the little cans and you set them somewhere discreet and every half hour it goes and it shoots this little air freshener 
I started doing that with Jack and Gracie when we adopted them and they were boxers because Jack was so gassy he just was a gassy dog even on specialty foods he was a very gassy dog and I'll tell you that stuff is lethal <laughs> and um, so Jack uh, that's where I started the the little plug-in things were a waste of time but these little air fresheners with the cans um, let me see, I've got one here. i got to get another can of stuff for them. I had one and I dropped it and the top of it cracked. Um, Glade, it, this one, is, it's ugly, but it sits behind a picture so you don't see it. Um, it's a Glade air freshener and it, and it can go every 9, 18, or 36 minutes. So I keep it set at 36. I wish it would go every hour. It's a little too much for me, but anyway. Uh, and I just get it. Walmart uh, air fresheners, they're cheaper. They're not cheap, but they're cheaper. So I use those. At, but sometimes I want to run a diffuser with essential oils because they're a little stronger, they're a little different, and um, they they tend to cut through, especially in the winter where the air doesn't move as much. To me, the diffuser does a little better. But one thing you have to watch, especially through the holiday season, is not to use, there are certain essential oils that are toxic to dogs and cats and you know people like to have a lot of pine scent well pine and citrus because people will get those will get oranges out and they'll plug uh, uh, cloves in them and hang them all around pine and citrus are not safe for your dogs so according there's a site there's several of them but, but this one partic particular one is called pets online no, petpoisonhelpline.com. It's all one word, P-E-T-P-O-I-S-O-N-H-E-L-P-L-I-N-E. -E. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, has a pretty good list of, of um, essential oils you should steer clear of. And some of the ones for dogs... Uh, tea tree oil, pennyroyal, wintergreen, eastern tea berry, and the pine oils are all listed as being poisonous to dogs. And so, so the diffusers shoot the oils in a very fine mist. It looks like fog, but it's it's not exactly fog because it's got the, the fine oil mist of the essential oils. And even if you just use a couple drops, that oil is in the air. The animals, the dogs, cats, birds. You know, all that. even humans were breathing those oils in to the respiratory system. And it can make your pets, you know, cough, gag, slobber, sneeze, gasp, pant. I mean, they're just in distress because they're, it's making them sick. Now, a, cat, a list for cats on that same site is much longer. Well, it wasn't a list in the cats. It was a paragraph. You had to, had to peel through it. But the list for cats is a lot longer. It's wintergreen, oil of sweet birch, citrus oils, pine oils, ylang lang oil, peppermint oil. I love the scent of peppermint. I love peppermint candy, too. But peppermint oil, cinnamon oil. Oh, cinnamon oil and I have a hate-hate relationship. I, I can't, it, it locks my lungs up. It puts me in respiratory distress. There's, um, at our farm market, and I may have shared this a couple weeks ago, they had this little hut. They're calling it a Christmas hut. It looks like a little miniature Quonson hut. And inside, uh, because all of the, you know, Christmas trees and wreaths and stuff are outside. Well, this is set up in the, um, in the sheltered area, and it's like a Christmas house. And I think just for, through the window, it looked like they had some hand-carved and crafty kind of things for sale in there. But when I popped the door open, I was smacked in the face, like with a sledgehammer, with this overpowering cinnamon oil. And what it probably was, if it wasn't a diffuser, it was probably pine cones. Because, oh, everybody likes to have those pine cones that are soaked in cinnamon oil. No, 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 no. I, they... People with lung sensitivities and, and things like that, you, you cause them a lot of trouble. I have complained to 
grocery stores and stuff with the manager and said, you know, you gotta, you got to move that stuff outside. People like me who can't breathe from that stuff, it's like, I, I know there's probably some people out there rolling their eyes. This I'm not talking about it just makes me sneeze a couple times. I'm talking about it. My lungs start revolting. And I cough and can't breathe. I have the slightest scent of that. I go the opposite direction and all the way around. I won't even go up an aisle if those things are in that aisle. So here I am at the at the farm market and boom, I get hit with this just opening the door. And I and the woman standing there, hi, can I help you? And I'm like, oh my God, that cinnamon. I can't, I can't even come in the door. Sorry. And I just shut the door. I coughed for 10 minutes. I coughed for, and all I did was open the door and inhale it because I wasn't expecting it, and I coughed for 10 minutes. So cinnamon oil, penrose oil, clove oil. You know, I was telling you a lot of people like to put the cloves in the oranges and hang them up. Well, your, your citrus oil and your clove oil are toxic to cats. Eucalyptus oil, and that's a lot of people use eucalyptus oil as an inhaler to clear up if they have congestion and sinus. Um, Vicks Vapor Rub has eucalyptus in it or something like eucalyptus in it. So that and tea tree oil as well for cats. So, you know, those kind of things, they are toxic. You have to do some research and check with your veterinarian before you start loading your house up, especially in the winter time, especially if you have house cats. Because in the winter time when we don't have fresh air exchange that much, we're tightening up the house, we're, we're putting up um, heavier curtains, we're putting... Um, caulk in we're sealing up drafts and stuff there's not this fresh air exchange that you get to help dilute some of that stuff I mean you if you have it keep the cats out of the room where it is that's just what and, and dogs so you know check some reliable I mean don't just go to Jim Bob's all you want to know about cats.com Go to some reliable sites. Even the ASPC. The, I, I looked at ASPC. They didn't go into a lot of detail, but they did mention it. But go to them. Check with your veterinarian. Just don't load your house up with a lot of these scents. I did mention uh, a couple weeks ago that I saw a gray squirrel out back. And I, it was barking at me when I was putting some clothes and stuff out or hanging some towels out. I did get a squirrel feeder. I did get it put up. I don't know how long it's going to stay there, but I did get it put up, and I got a piece of that hard field corn stuff that they sell for feeding squirrels and such. I mean, it's hard. My chickens won't even fool with it. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I guess the the either the squirrel moved along was only there for the night or something maybe a hawk got it maybe some other kind of critter got it but it's not been out there it hasn't touched it hasn't touched that squirrel feeder so it's still sitting there just the same as it was the day I put it up Ooh, a reminder a reminder this is the 18th episode of the Holstein House podcast premiering on the Fountain Network if you found me on Fountain, I hope you'll boost, clip, and share with all your friends and followers. Uh, if I bring you value, I hope you'll give value. Surely the information on the uh, essential oils was valuable. Surely you want to chip in with that and, and share it with your friends that have house, house pets. So, all right, let's see. Oh, I was asked about where I'm at with my Bitcoin. Um I, I'm, it's kind of on pause with all of the hoorah, hoo-ha with the holidays. I just haven't been able to focus much on it. Um, I'm still very interested in it. It's not that I've, I've gone off of it. It's just the way things in my life cycle through, and there'll be periods where I can focus hot and heavy on something, and then, and then I have to go over here and do this. But I haven't given up on Bitcoin. Um I do want to get one, I think, isn't it called a cold storage wallet? The little little doohickey that you, you load and you store your own Bitcoin on. I want to get one of those. Um, that much I know I want to do. I uh, And maybe, I think, I would like to earn sats. Um, 
how do I say this delicately? Because I don't, I don't want to, I'm not trying to break any laws or anything, but I would rather earn the sats in trade for things than purchase them. You know what I'm saying? Um, purchasing, it's, I mean, I, I can do that. I don't mind to. I'm going to have to at some point. But right now, while I'm exploring this, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to deal with my tax person yet uh, and say, yeah, I did buy sats, you know, and I do, I'm trying to work my way up to a full Bitcoin and because she, she'll just lose her mind if I do that right now. I mean, the amount that I have is just so minuscule. So I'd rather continue to trade back and forth and um, build it up that way for right now than, um, you know, go out and, and load up a, a wallet and, and buy it. Now, let's see. The BNB update. So I've still got some open dates for December. I think I shared with you that we're now offering Hall's chocolate and Coal River coffee, freshly ground Coal River coffee, if you want it as part of your breakfast. Now, we do have a Keurig machine. And you are, or well, I should say guests. It could be you. You could be a guest. You're more than welcome. But guests have the option of the Keurig machine for coffee. I do have teas and um, apple cider during the season and hot chocolate during the season, K-cups. So if you're at breakfast and you want a hot chocolate, it's there. If you would rather have a hot cider, it's there. You could use it of the evenings. Most people don't. But it's there if you wanted to use it of the evenings as well. But we part of the packages that uh, I have set up for our direct book only includes now the option for freshly ground Coal River coffee. That would be ground at breakfast before brewing not in a K cup I have purchased the whole beans and I will manually ground or grind I should say the beans as part of that package for my direct book guests direct book only so what you would do is you go to robinholstein.com Look at the menu, choose Holstein House from the menu, then use the link for direct book. There is a link for Airbnb, so, you know, pay attention to what you're doing. Use the link for the direct book, choose the date you want to stay, and you will see the option for chocolate and coffee stay package. So I have a couple of different packages up. One is for October and one is for February. You, I mean, if you're staying, if you want to come and stay in February or October, you are fully welcome to choose those packages. However, you cannot choose the February package for stays in January. So just because you can book in January, that doesn't work that way. But if you are staying between now and the end of January, you can choose the coffee and chocolate stay package and you will have some Hall's chocolate, West Virginia made, Swiss style chocolates in your room and you will ha have uh, Coal River coffee freshly ground at your breakfast table. So um, I am looking, I'm learning to make macchiato. Now I've only done it twice so far, <laughs> but it might become a special perk for direct book guests as well as the fresh ground Coal River coffee. I purchased an inexpensive stovetop 
express espresso maker. It's not express as an exp. It's espresso, esp. And a milk frother. And I my thought was, hey, I'll make cappuccino. Well, there's this <laughs> distinction between cappuccino and macchiato, and apparently. Uh, if you are not steaming the milk, which I don't have a steamer, that's too much to get into at this point as I'm learning how to, to do this, and I don't know what the demand will be. Um, if you steam it, you make, if you steam the milk, you're making cappuccino. If you're just frothing the milk, which is kind of a, a, a whipping of just plain uh, whole milk or skim milk, then it's a macchiato. So I, I have the frother. Uh, it's just a little tiny, teeny tiny. I mean, the, the whisk part is not any bigger than a nickel. But uh, you use that to froth the milk for the macchiato. Um, I am practicing. I, the first batch I made, I had too much milk in the little container, and it just went everywhere. Oh, my gosh, I made such a mess. And I'm learning to put it... The, what the best order of steps would be. So for me, I if I'm drinking regular brewed coffee or percolator coffee, all I need is some milk, milk or cream, or half and half, you know, whatever. But for this, I have to have it's so strong. I have to have a little bit of sugar, and if I'm going to make it a mocha, then of course you have to put the the chocolate in there. Or the cocoa, so I'm I'm trying to work out the best way to heat the cup, then put the sugar and the chocolate, then the coffee, or espresso, and then the the froth, and then I, so I've only done it twice. I don't I don't have it down yet. <laughs> I can't make all those fancy. I do have a couple stencils where you can where I can take in and tap a little cinnamon or or tap a little chocolate or cocoa across the top of the foam um, and have little decorations on there but I can't do the um, you know how they make little hearts and stuff out I, I can't do that yet but I've only done it twice so I mean you know but I will offer it free to guests initially while I'm learning because I don't want to you know charge my guests for something as part of a package and that I don't know how to make so the first little first few times it's going to be plus I'm making it for myself while I'm learning to make it and the pot is small I I either need smaller cups because I'm not 100% sure what the proper serving size is if I use my regular coffee mugs <laughs> that little that little stovetop coffee maker or espresso maker <laughs> that's not enough for anybody but uh, I think you're supposed to use a smaller cup, and if that's the case, then I can get, I believe I get two servings out of this small aluminum pot, and it's different in that a percolator, the boiling water bubbles up the tube and across and down over the grounds. grounds. It's similar with um, a drip coffee maker. The hot water is dripping over top of the grounds. This contraption, the hot water boils and the steam and the pressure builds up in the bottom of the container and it, it steams through the grounds and through the tube and bubbles out into the carafe. And I'm thinking after I'm watching this, sorry about that, I think I just bumped the mic. Um, what's the difference between this thing and the Keurig? The Keurig is, is pressure, pressuring hot water through the K-cup, through the grounds, into the cup. Unless it's a temperature difference in the steam. See, I need to look into that because I may have just wasted about 15 bucks in that little pot when I've got the Keurig in there. It's doing the same thing. So I don't know, but I am learning. All right, well, this past Sunday was the third Sunday of Advent. Um, it was the Joy Sunday, 
uh, marked by the lighting of the pink or the rose-colored candles in a wreath for those who, who practice that. And this is the one where we're reminded of the news that shall be a great joy to all people, the news that Emmanuel is born, God with us. And we stand in the promise even today, even here in this place, in your place, that God is with you. And there can be no greater joy than that. So at our church service this past week, we read, uh, or we, we lit the third Advent candle. Actually, we, we light all three of them, but we, we moved up to the third one, which is the joy candle. And our um, our devotional was focused on Isaiah 35 and Psalm 146. And it went like this. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. The psalmist says, Happy are these whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made the heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. And that's from Psalm 146. And then we light the candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination, and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. So that was just our little Advent reading at at service today, or not today, Sunday. Of course, I just read it today, but anyway. And our service went quite well, as it normally does. We're still looking for our pastor. I'm still leading the services, which is fine. I do have, uh, you know, the normal doubts and reservations that come with somebody who doesn't feel that they're qualified, but that's okay. God doesn't always call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And don't forget that I want to state clearly I am a follower of Christ. I'm technically a member of the United Methodist Church. However, I first put the teachings of Christ, not the book of discipline. And when I discuss religion or my beliefs, I will be speaking as a follower of Christ and not a Methodist member or representative, even though we did read that and as we uh, conducted our Advent service. I don't project it here to you as a member of the Methodist Church. I project it to you as a follower of Christ. So don't forget also on a totally different topic here, If you're traveling the West Virginia Turnpike and you're traveling to or through West Virginia and you need a place to stop, look up Holstein House, either at robinholstein.com or on Airbnb. 
And remember, if you book direct, I do have those uh, specials that you can avail yourself of, and that would be the special coffee and chocolate. You don't get that through Airbnb. However, if you book through Airbnb and you mention that you heard of it on the podcast, I will come up with something to um, add a little value to your stay, some homemade cookies or some uh, extra special homemade bread, which I usually offer homemade bread anyway, but I'll I'll come up with something, maybe some homemade English muffins. Um, and But we'll, we'll do something to help, uh, help uh, thank you for listening to the podcast and, and recognizing you. Um, if you try to do that through Airbnb, they want a bit of the action. So they would take a piece of, the, uh, of what you're paying and, um, and, and keep it in their own pocket, even though they didn't have anything to do with it. But anyway. If you want to pay with Bitcoin, you have to do that with a direct book, obviously. And uh, I don't think that Airbnb has any intentions at this point to accept Bitcoin or any other um, digital currencies. I've seen stories, but I haven't seen anything to back them up. It's just kind of been gossip. So, uh, but if you want to do that, you need a direct book and you need to reach out to me and say, hey, I'd rather pay in Bitcoin and I'll, I'll discount your stay for you a little bit. So that's, I'm going to be start wrapping up episode 18 of the Hosting House podcast. Uh, twice now, the Hosting House podcast has been in the top 50 on the Fountain.fm network and I love you all for helping me achieve that. It might only last for a day or so, but all the same, I did break through and make it. But uh, before I go, let me get, share you uh, with you some of the supporters that we have had in the past few days. HJ, always faithful, has shared 568 sats. Yeah! <laughs> Euphrosinos has shared a total of 4,020 sats, commenting on the fourth doctor being the best doctor, using cast iron, and some audio issues I was struggling through trying to use a different uh, different PC setup. Yeah! <laughs> Jed D., I think that's how you pronounce it, J-E-Y-D-D, shared 1,021 sats, (laughs) sharing a little bit about using cast iron cookware, and user 60861, 87853536742 shared 500 sats yeah! and simply said hi well, your continued support while I stumble through all of this is greatly appreciated. We premiered the podcast on the Fountain Network. Uh, if you found me on the Fountain, I hope you'll boost, clip, and share with all your friends and followers. If I bring you value, I hope you will share value. And if you found me on one of the other uh, podcast apps, I think iHeart and Podbean and... Uh, there's another one, I think. I can't remember what it is. But if you found me on any of uh, any of the other ones, I hope you'll reach out to me through my website at robinholstein.com and let me know. And uh, and spread the word and, and spread the love, as some of them like to say. So, there you have it. Post your comments. Do all that boosting, liking, sharing, thumbs up, and stuff that helps spread the word and poke the algorithms. Follow me on most of the big social media platforms and look for my name, Robin Holstein, or Holstein House. Till next time, bye-bye.